Well, I have a lot of questions, but I bet there's also a ton of questions from the audience. Uh, considering this is a kind of hybrid talk here, um, I would say either you raise your hand in the in the virtual audience or you just write into the chat and the people here um, just do it. It's pretty much live. Uh, Michael, I raised my go hand. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a lot. I mean, there's there's so much so much possibilities. This this space is almost em, uh, endless to, yes, to really that's right. things. What what um, I was really interested in. So the vision you you showed for the upcoming years is um, uh, in in Helmholtz currently, and, and I just finished that actually. The um, what, what we saw over the last two years is the use of large scale facilities for large scale research facilities. Uh, to allow for remote access. And that was a real issue because uh, usually a week of, of using such a facility is on the order of 100 to 250K. <clears throat> and if the people just can't come, this even, even if you have the slot and you can't work, then we have a problem there. And we have a huge problem because the, the facility has to be running and, and it will run regardless if it works or not. So uh, one of the very interesting things now is uh, people finally realize that bringing the user to the machine does not have to happen uh, in reality, so to say, but more in virtual reality or something else. However, um, the way of doing this is, is quite, well, let's say 80s style still. The, the best I saw up until now was a Zoom feed of the of the control board and somebody uh, shouting over Zoom, press that button or press that. that that's exaggerating, yeah, yeah, but, but, but yeah. there have been much better, better in, uh, interfaces, but this is something like state of the art that happens a lot. Uh, and I, I see a lot of possibilities there. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the one of the critical things is, of course, latency, for example, working with, for example, if, if I want to have a target that has to be aligned by sub-micron accuracy mm -hmm. to really be shot by a large-scale laser that's three kilometers long, I have to be pretty precise and I have to interact with this on a usually very low latency budget. Uh, but also in a low data budget sometimes, because not all the users have a broadband access to that to that facility. So how how do you see possibilities of what you showed here in in terms of combining this? Would would you say uh, there are solutions that could help with that, or would you say this is still too far off in the future because of latency or because of limited bandwidth? Yeah, and then this uh, thanks a lot. A very interesting. Uh, it's was not just a question; it's a huge area of, 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 of potential uh, um, research. Specific interests. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But I can first of all say um, it depends really very much on the particular um, task you have to do. Like, is it really um, just um, steering whatever a microscope or steering a laser beam? What kind of parameters are you basically um, expecting to input to this device? This is one. Thing. And of course, the latency is something we did not um, deal a lot with, to be honest. This is something we should rather maybe clarify on the network side. But what we can, of course, support is um, precise interaction. That's so precision is something what we can certainly where we can make sure that um, you have the ability to. So to, to steer this uh, laser uh, exactly to the position you want to have it. And second, of course, um, to not use interaction modalities, which again introduce latency. For example, if, if you first do some hand tracking and then you have to some, some gesture recognition and maybe just use, for example, you just use the movement of the hands, uh, maybe to input a parameter, that would not be very suitable. So in other words, we could like reduce on the human side the, the latency first of all and we can increase the precision and then of course we need to look at the task that's very important because sometimes for sometimes it might be that we first have some like approximation of, or some rough input say if you want to roughly orient something for example and then later on have the precise uh, fine-tuning of parameters i think we should talk about um, 
specific details. It's very difficult to generalize. Maybe just one aspect. Mm, uh, you know, perhaps that I have not a single VR example in my <laughs> in my uh, for, for purpose because I'm advocating a little bit uh, augmented reality. That means, of course, if you want to completely replicate, say, also the physical, that's another opportunity, the physical setup, you could use virtual reality, for example, like the, uh, the microscope, for example, in a different remote place. That's quite good. It helps. But it's interesting that some research, and maybe some research which still needs to be done also, recommends that this orientation you have in, in your real life um, is helpful. So therefore, I'm advocating a little bit augmented reality. That means even if we in this room, for example, would replicate some microscope or, um, or parts of it, um, it could be helpful to, to somehow orient it here and to make it um, have landmarks, physical landmarks, some research indicating that. But for example, that would be a very nice um, direct collaboration to, to compare these uh, possibilities to each other. Okay, but of course, virtual reality is, is, is good as well, so don't, don't get me wrong. We do some VR stuff as well, but I just left it out. Thank you. <laughs> <For today. laughs> Still okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but sometimes it's not necessary because it introduces, and that's what I want to introduce some extra hurdles, introduce some extra delays, for example, and people are getting uncomfortable after a while and maybe are not oriented, so perfectly, etc. Yeah, so it's a huge area. Yeah, thanks. No, no simple answer. Yeah. Um, if I may quickly comment on that as well. So, if I, I, I think, just my opinion, the two are also pretty much complementary in some cases, yes. right? So, for example, for the tracking tasks we're doing in cell tracking, it's very useful that you can shut out the outside world, that you don't get distractions, that people don't look in places where you don't want them to be looking. Yes. So, I think in, in uh, as, as you said, it has to be tailored to the exact application. And to be honest, in the long run, my money is also totally on AR. So <laughs> I'm with you there. Yeah, but, but, but we don't know it. I mean, anyway, the devices, they are mixing, of course, even VR devices, like the one you mentioned, they have, of course, cameras and they can at least do some through AR, which is not exactly the same because we have some perspective issues, et cetera, and viewing angle problems. But, uh, yes. Okay, um, we have another question from the audience from Wildan. Wildan, would you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can yes. hear you. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, it's very, I mean, impressive. And then I have many questions, but I just, uh, I, th I think I can, only, I, I, I can only ask one question. So concerning this, uh, that you sh when you show this not links diagram, Oh, uh, my question is: Was it was it built based on ontology, or you, you just use like graphical database in order to explore as an alternative for the, for example, to to explore large ontology itself? So, what is what is the the background in building like this? I mean, is it designed to 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 understand as an alternative for the ontologies, large ontologies, or just uh, you? I mean, but are we, what I mean is like, is it built based on already ontologies, this, this, uh, um, So was, was the question whether this was an ontology visualization or whether we used ontology for building this graph or what was- Yes, it? yes, that things, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, correct. So in, in this case, it had nothing to do with ontologies. Okay. To be honest, it was just a person graph, what, what you saw in this example. But in another project in, in my Sonderforschungs by CRC, we um, are working with ontologies and we, have ontology graphs basically and oh. use it in combination with some proof graphs so there's some theoretic stuff so from uh, description logic uh, representation you don't want to know about all the details um, and uh, so, so basically it's you show proofs and you relate to them to concepts in an ontology basically and in that case we for example use um, no link um, representations of ontologies all right so um, so so that 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 movie and figure is not yet with kind of the things okay then i understand okay but thank we, you. basically we, uh, the, i need to say that some of you see that some of our projects are just using some example data not every project is a dedicated um, project to an application domain i have to say that because this is basic research not everyone has these display facilities so we sometimes do not also have the time to um, dive deeply into some domain for example 
There are examples where we have domain specific solutions. They are typically not so sexy, let's put it like that, and not so novel, but this is good because um, um, some uh, things are really rather futuristic still, and of course, uh, just show the possibilities in general. So we differentiate a little bit between applied projects, let's put it like that, which are domain specific, as well as some foundational research, for example, exploring novel uh, display technologies or combinations. Right, okay, thank you. Good then, thank you very much. Um, is there, Martin, yes. Uh, maybe a more general question. Um, I can see instantly um, the appeal for teaching, education, science communication, and so on. But you explicitly ma mentioned um, science is at the center of your research. Mm -hmm. So in, let's take this, this Boston LED wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you measure the success and benefit of your technologies? Because I could understand if, if you have the data of Baltimore mm -hmm. and you make this nice LED wall placing the 47 graphs and think about where to put one, then you probably are so accustomed with the data that you already know the data so well that you wouldn't need the stuff what you what you just did anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you measure the success of these technologies and say this is a real benefit to explore data to find something no one else? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. And of course, uh, typically people are accustomed to what they use. I mean, you are using a laptop, and so um, and you will be surprised, like in ten years or so, that you are using augmented reality, perhaps. And so and you, and you maybe uh, will remember. Oh, yeah. Or let, let's just take the example of a smartphone. Um, I mean, this really is a success story uh, only started in 2007 or so, and um, this is not long ago, like 15 years ago, or, or speech input, for example. People are using that now, so that means, in general, I, I would say, since some of the parts, so this is the first part of my answer, is some of the parts are, of course, a bit visionary, and of course, I don't claim that this will become the future. It's just an exploration of potential ways into the future. This is first. But we do studies. Uh, we do user studies. Uh, so this is um, uh, a way how we uh, value, uh, validate and evaluate our research. That means we compare um, how people interact with it and whether they are doing a better job than with a comparison system. Not always is a comparison system available or com uh, no baseline condition in, in every case. But there are some cases where we clearly have baseline conditions and we just measure performance, task performance on particular tasks. So, um, like, um, for example, we did a measurement of this. Um, I just sh shortly showed you this tracked device where you see some, saw some hate map and you, people were uh, walking around a table and we compared um, touch interaction versus uh, for example, spatial interaction. And we found out that it's not good for everything. Yeah, so it depends on the task. That's our way how we validate that. And um, that means, yeah, basically user studies uh, and some of them of qualitative nature, but most often also quantitative user studies. And then we can compare. Still, I have to, to admit, it's always with novel technology. Of course, say the transparent tab that you see on, on the bottom here. This is not the transparent tablet you will hold in your hands in 10 years from Samsung or so. This will be a better tablet than the one from Samsung. Yeah, that's for sure than our self-built stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> um, so, so therefore, you get the idea. Uh, there's always some bias, uh, of course, because it's novel technology and maybe tracking doesn't work perfectly. And yeah, therefore, I don't claim that it's always better, but. Uh, Last point on that, but I agree on an important point you make, that if you really want to do serious stuff, then obviously some of the techniques are not so suitable. So I don't want to ban the mouse, for example, or precise keyboard input, so don't get me wrong. Um, and I'm not advocating that everything um, is working perfectly, like, for example, gesture interaction to write your thesis is obviously not a good idea. I mean, you can use gestures to input text, yeah? but it takes a while and even longer. So the, the average PhD times will increase by another three years if you use your interaction. So you get the idea. <laughs> and you get the idea that uh, <laughs> we need to be that we are not having too much toy examples. So that's what I agree. I totally agree with you that we also try to demonstrate some benefit. And that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I, I also have a, can I, can I? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, during your talk, I actually just had a little bit of an epiphany. So my, my original question was uh, around tabletops and large display walls, whether you see that taking off because it's a, you know, this also this mighty device interaction mm -hmm. seemed a little bit esoteric. And I thought that thought by dragging a screenshot from my laptop to my tablet, and I thought, hey, well, wait. <laughs> so I think lots of these technologies kind of just sneak into daily use, more or less. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you've seen anything like that with display walls, with, with uh, any kind of multi device interaction. And also, when you sit here, you know, this could be a large yeah, and, yeah. you know, move That's also a very interesting question because uh, I have a split opinion. Recently, like a couple of years ago, I thought this takes off and we just need to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not super sure about that. For example, tabletops, they, um, and this has also to do with availability and with commercial support. Some of you might have um, maybe a Microsoft Surface device. Maybe you have one. Mm -hmm. And do you know where the name comes from? Microsoft Service. Microsoft Service was the first commercial tabletop. It was a tabletop. And they invented this name for a tabletop. And later on, it was called Samsung 40, this device. And then they uh, were stealing that name or abandoning it and used it for this entire product range of services, what you now have. But originally in 2010, it was a tabletop. Yeah. And this is always a little bit, I mean, it has to do with, of course, with market power as well and uh, um, demands and, uh, uh, of course, companies. Yeah. But for example, with large displays or, or such such solutions like this one here, that we have here this um, uh, whiteboards, electronic whiteboards, they certainly take off and this will, uh, this will uh, definitely increase. And once this is really cheap and this is a thin OLED of a huge size, for example, mm -hmm. And then you can, of course, also use uh, use it on walls. And, and, and so therefore, I think this will can maybe tabletop will not take off. Even so, I believe they're quite good. <clears throat> because I built the first in 2007 myself, <clears throat> multi-touch tabletop with pen interaction, which was quite cool back then. But um, yeah. I'm a bit unsure. But also a thing about cost, right? When the, when the surface came out, it cost uh, quite a lot of money. Yeah, right? that's right. Which was the same case for smartphones, but then mm -hmm. yeah, they became ubiquitous. Thank you. <laughs> Micha. The, the other thing where, so, so a lot of the things we're currently looking at is uh, not just making things more accessible from remote, mm -hmm but also combining this with uh, analytics, so visual analytics mainly. Uh, because uh, when we do experiments as large scale facilities, one of the biggest problems right now is that what we see in the experiment is usually not what we anticipated. Surprise, that's why we are doing the experiments. <laughs> so we have to combine what we're seeing in the experiment with the knowledge we gathered beforehand and to compare this really. And one of the problems we, we usually have with that is that data is not readily available because it would come from large scale simulations or large scale data sets. We hope to do a lot of AI and surrogate modeling with that, but still <clears throat> we can talk about petabytes of data with which we compare. And of course, it's always the human that makes all of the problems because if I could directly compare the experimental data with a with a model and get the difference and know what I'm talking about, I would automate all of that and not include the human at all because they make all the problems. Yes. But for some reason, they are still quite valuable and can actually have good ideas in a short amount of time that the AI does not have. And so, so this is the other application area we, where we are currently really seeing a benefit from these technologies to be able to compare a large set of known data of previously available data to data coming in from the experiment and really seeing what could be the difference. And of course, again, I could do this all with my Jupyter notebook and that's how it's usually done and you run your analysis scripts and you compare. But this doesn't work very well, and it's not super fast. It's, it, it, 
takes actually quite a while. Mm -hmm. and, and usually I have to do analysis from the experiment and then com compare this with analysis from the simulation. Why I would rather really see the experiment from the simulation side and from the experiment side and compare those two together and really compare experimental signal to, to, um, to, to simulated signal and also to systems parameters that describe yeah. the system. Yeah. So how do you see this coming up, coming about? Do you, do, you, do you think that technologies that I saw here today would would help with that or do you think that there the interaction on a more numerical base with a Jupyter notebook yeah. will, will prevail for some time? I think where they could help is certainly um, if you are able, for example, um, simulation parameters to steer them or to change them also. And if you were able to do that interactively and see results coming in very soon, basically. Yeah. Um, and then to be able to adapt this, um, that would be very, very good. And if you're able even to use comparison, also even visual comparison techniques between experiments and simulation, for example, because people are very good in um, seeing differences. That's very good. Exactly. Of course, computers are also good in doing that, but they are, have to sometimes apply a bit more brute force to figure out different. But people see that quite often, and so if they are able to say um, uh, interactively change parameters, for example, of the simulation or even experimental parameters to make them whatever adjust them to a simulation, they run in parallel. So that would be very helpful. I think, and I, I, I heard the, the word steering. One of yeah. one of the things I'm I'm wondering about because of course we're working on on looking at data um, at really large amounts of high dimensional data, yeah. which is usually not very fit for human interaction yes, in I some understand. sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I sometimes have the feeling that if we have kind of a mix that we have like intelligence, intelligent agents to push us in the right direction of the parameter space and say, not look there, look there and now give me your opinion. Yes. That would be that would be a very interesting mix because as a human, I have a problem in really going for large large parameter spaces and remember stuff. At least I do. Most people. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear. <laughs> it's not I, just. I, I think that's a very good combination. For example, what you could do, you could have several agents, which, for example, prepare certain directions, possible yeah. directions, and then show them to you as examples or so, oh. and you compare them. Like I mentioned, this concept of small multiples or so. Mm -hmm. So you could, for example, see it like 10 variants or so, which are proposed by agents maybe automatically and you judge them from as a human being you say this this goes in the right direction for example like these two variants i like to follow these for example and then you could refine it and so another technique if you are able to make this a little bit scalable which is of course uh, scalable in terms of um, like the uh, the resolution of the, how should I say that? I mean, not scalable in terms of the uh, spatial resolution, obviously, but scalable in terms of if you're able to have some uh, coarse parameter adjustments first, and then do the refinement later on, then you could, uh, first of all, just compare these variants on a causal level, mm -hmm. yeah, and then maybe refine the certain um, mm -hmm. part of the, the branch or the tree, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. um, that would be interesting. And of course, this could be uh, empowered by agents as well. So they, with, with some, and I, I think this this is a very promising combination of, of these two. And, and in particular, I think it could also inform the agents for yes. if you have yeah. repetitive yeah. task on that data, you can in principle what you what you did is you make a, you make a certain choice, and if you make a certain choice, you can say that was a good choice or that was a bad choice. That's of course another thing. You could also just uh, have exemplary. In, I mean, uh, I have pro projects with medical people, with surgeons, and the surgeons they uh, do some um, interactions, say with with an endoscope or with some. Uh, Laboroscope, for example, and so and then the system can learn from that and compare that, uh, and so you could basically demonstrate it to, to the system so that it can automatically deduct. Was it, for example, in this case, in the medical project, um, 
input by the students is compared to the expert input by means of an AI system. Okay. Yeah? And the AI system basically learns from the experts and then okay. shows the students in, in contrast basically uh, what they should have done or, or the, distance, okay. the distance between their solution uh, okay. and, uh, and to the surgeon, for example. And that's, that's a, such an example of uh, um, using human input, say expert input, um, to later on do the task maybe automatically. Thank you. That, that's that's quite awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know it's <clears throat> all right. Uh, do we have maybe some more questions from the virtual audience? Is the virtual audience still here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a, I still have a question and you always have the last one so you are I, I, want, I wanted to keep up the tradition you know yes and Is that, yeah, yeah good, great <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I was wondering when you when you showed this uh, proxemics interaction with people yeah. getting closer to the wall and further yeah. away. This seems like a supernatural thing, right? When you take a picture and you don't have a zoom lens, you yeah. step a bit more further away, step closer. Um, but in, in terms of these uh, display systems, like our systems or whatever, uh, you have the opportunity to do the scaling yourself, right? It could be logarithmic, it could be linear, yeah. it could be whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not even the same for each case, but it, it, did you do any kind of uh, investigation in what, what kind of behavior people prefer there? No, we didn't, we, didn't do, we didn't do that, but that would be very interesting. Of course, the mapping, uh, how, mm -hmm. what kind of scale, like type scale or whatever scale it is, would be very interesting to see. But I think, again, it would be application dependent. But in principle, yes, this sounds interesting to see how people, and people could even change the scale if they like, say they have some additional size smartphone or so, and they say, oh, this is jumping too fast or whatever, and then you can just use some slider also to, to adjust it. Okay. I could easily imagine that you know when you, when you for example scroll through time points that there's more like the expectation of this being linear, right? Mm -hmm. But when you do maybe a spatial thing, then then you would expect the behavior maybe like in Google Maps that you know it would it would actually go exponentially the further yes, you go exactly. away. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's that's it's quite fascinating. Yeah, because there's we need to try that. <laughs> Just as the last comment on that um, the. The, the sheer movement is called physical navigation, where, where the display does not change. So just by, by going away, of course, I zoom yeah. out of the way, and yeah, I zoom in, and nothing changes here. Or if I go to, to the left hand side, I suddenly see a picture. So um, this is just physical navigation, just by means of your body mm -hmm. movement. But then, of course, you can um, enforce that, or you can have some semantic zooming or some nonlinear, whatever, changes. Mm -hmm. and all that. That's quite interesting to see. <clears throat> cool. Thank you. Okay. We are tired now. Then we are done for today. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending and yeah, big thanks you. to you, Raymond, for, for uh, coming to us today and uh, giving this yep. great talk. Yeah, thank you.